To tame a wild river is to challenge the forces of nature, especially when the river is as powerful and unruly as the Tennessee. This is the story of men whose daring and vision sparked the biggest engineering challenge in history. Could they tame an entire river system thousands of miles long to serve mankind? A project of this scope had never been attempted. Dozens of massive dams, 200,000 workers, a billion dollar price tag. If successful, it would be a nationwide model with power, industry and modernization beyond anyone's wildest dreams. If unsuccessful, it could leave the country bitter at the audacity of the federal government. The Tennessee Valley Authority, the TVA, would become one of America's greatest gambles. The whole world watched as America's best minds set out to tame the Tennessee. In the early 1930s, few people had greater reason to curse Mother Nature than residents of the Tennessee River Valley. Every spring brought on an onslaught from above. Up to six feet of rain pounded the valley each year, making it one of the wettest and flood-prone regions in all of North America. Well, the, the Great Tennessee River was a beautiful river, but it could be a deadly one. The engineers called it a flashy river, and that meant it could rise from uh, a, a relatively mild stream to a raging killer in a very short time. Floods took a frightening human toll. Hundreds were killed, thousands left homeless, forced to take refuge in tents. The river left no life untouched, even the lives of children. As a matter of fact, the first word I ever said was water coming down. There had been a little flood on the little stream in front of my house. So I didn't just speak a word. I said water coming down. The rains took a toll on the land as well. Each year the valley lost tons of precious topsoil. Where cotton and corn once thrived, the land now bore brutal scars of erosion. Being a part of the Tennessee River Valley was the fact that uh, what was given to you could also be taken away. It could take away the land, and it did. The rains came, eroded the mountains, eroded the fields, eroded the pastures. So the rain that was nurturing uh, could also ruin the land. This was the sorry state of life in the hills of Appalachia. The rains kept people from ever getting ahead. Farmers lived in shacks without electric lights or running water. There were no radios, no refrigerators, no modern conveniences. The tired soil kept people on the brink of starvation. Without a sound economy, there was little money for things like education. Children learned just the basics in drafty one-room schools. There was little money for adequate health care either. One third of the valley was stricken every year by a disease unheard of in most of the United States, malaria. In many ways, the Tennessee Valley was 100 years behind the times and showed little promise of ever catching up. Ironically, the very river that had brought decades of disaster could also provide salvation Water was the valley's greatest natural asset. If properly developed, it could provide a vital route for shipping and enough electric power to fuel an industrial revolution. What residents needed was the money and the know-how to harness the river's great potential. They would get it in 1933 as part of President Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal. As Roosevelt took office, the entire nation was suffering the same economic misfortunes that had befallen the Tennessee Valley for generations. The Great Depression robbed 15 million people of their jobs, 25% of the workforce. Shanty towns popped up everywhere, filled with drifters seeking employment. 
Men paraded through towns to offer their labor for one dollar a week. Much of the country had simply, I think, given up. A sort of depression psychosis develops where you haven't found a job and you haven't found a job and hopelessness uh, becomes, the, uh, becomes a fundamental fact of your life. The Great Depression hit the Tennessee Valley especially hard. Here, entire families lived on less than $100 a year. The South, uh, compared with the rest of the nation, was much poorer. Uh, everything that was bad in the nation was compounded in the South and made even worse in the Appalachian area. This great nation will endure as it has endured, will revive and will prosper. At his inauguration, President Roosevelt promised quick action to rescue the country from poverty. And he picked the bleakest spot he could find, the Tennessee Valley, to lead the way. At the river town of Muscle Shoals, Roosevelt proposed a wild scheme, a federal super agency that would tame the river by building a system of giant dams. We are here because the Muscle Shoals development and the Tennessee River development as a whole are national in their aspect and are going to be treated from a national point of view. Construction would provide desperately needed jobs and the dams would ultimately generate power to improve people's lives. The Tennessee Valley Authority, the TVA, was given unprecedented powers over a huge portion of the southeastern United States. 40,000 square miles were involved, nearly all of Tennessee and parts of Kentucky, Virginia, North Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, and Mississippi. Roosevelt included the entire Tennessee River, all 652 miles, as well as thousands of miles of tributaries, an entire watershed. Altogether then, what he saw was a, a system of regional planning, the first real attempt to do that anywhere in this country. And using the, the Tennessee Valley as a model, if TVA worked, for the social and economic development of that entire region, then he thought we could replicate other TVAs around the country, and eventually he envisioned a national planning agency, a national TVA. President Roosevelt proposed the TVA in his first 100 days in office. The bill was highly controversial and extremely vague about precisely what TVA would do. But the president rammed it through Congress in just five weeks. To lead his bold experiment, the president picked two men who would become one of history's great odd couples. Actually, the TVA board was comprised of three members, but two of the three quickly stood out for their unbridled drive and ambition. For chairman, the president picked America's foremost hydraulic engineer, Arthur Morgan. My father was very tough-minded, but soft-hearted. He had this enormous commitment to human well-being, to humanity, to the future. Morgan was the epitome of the self-made man. He had quit college after just two months to travel. He picked up technical skills by working as a logger, miner, and farmhand. Morgan used this knowledge to build an innovative flood control project in Ohio, which won international acclaim. Despite his lack of formal training, Morgan became president of Antioch College, a small experimental school in Yellow Springs, Ohio. He was definitely a dreamer, but he was also extremely able in bringing his dreams to life. He has been characterized as a utopian, but he was a down-to-earth utopian, one who made utopia happen. Behind his stern expressions was a charismatic man, one who persuaded engineers to work for the good of society. It was incredible how he could create disciples with his talk about cooperation and goodwill and straightforwardness and the importance of always acting in the proper way for the long run, never being expedient for the here and now. On the other hand, if he didn't inspire you, if you didn't become his disciple, you were more than likely to find him a bit narrow-minded, a bit dogmatic, and quite a bit uh, paternalistic and find him uh, altogether too much to take. 
Beside Morgan on the TVA board sat a man young enough to be his son. A man with no engineering skills whatsoever. David Lilienthal was a Harvard-educated lawyer who was picked for his brilliant legal mind and keen sense of politics. Lilienthal had forged his reputation by attacking utility companies in Chicago and Wisconsin. He'd won huge refunds for customers who'd been overcharged by the phone company. While Arthur Morgan saw TVA as a giant engineering experiment, Lilienthal saw something else. Lilienthal thought in terms of the battle, the political battle, the struggle, and the struggle for Lilienthal's career as, as well. To Lilienthal, the Tennessee Valley Authority meant electric power, proving the case that publicly owned electrical power companies were the way to go. The two leaders couldn't have been more different, and they began to fight one another immediately. Friends had warned Arthur Morgan to oppose Lilienthal's appointment, but Morgan did not. He had an almost messianic ability to convince people of his ideas, and he, he felt that if he could sit down with Lilienthal, he could, they could work it out. Together, this odd couple moved to Tennessee. They had been given the power of kings to transform the Tennessee Valley. TVA didn't waste a single second, and bulldozers were on the move just months after the agency was created. 5,000 local men were hired immediately to begin clearing land. Whole forests came down so that trees would never clog the dams and reservoirs. The logs were salvaged and turned into lumber at local sawmills. The brush was burned in giant bonfires. Once the land was cleared, topsoil was blasted away to expose bedrock. Engineers found a bounty of raw materials in the valley. The hills were rich with limestone, a vital ingredient for concrete. Core samples were drilled to study the suitability of the rock for dam building. Then, hundreds of men known as powder monkeys carefully packed the bluffs with dynamite. Boulders as big as cars were methodically crushed into pea-sized pebbles to make concrete. Early on, TVA engineers discovered their mission posed a frightening technical dilemma. To improve navigation, the valley needed a series of low dams with locks so that barges could glide along the river step by step. But flood control and power generation required high dams to trap stormwater and slowly release it through electric turbines. Boats could not travel past dams like these. This was totally new to develop a whole river uh, in order to get the most you could out of that river. And our job was to get the most out, first for navigation, second for flood control, and third for power. You could build a system to do any one of those three, or you could do two of the three, but to do three of them, do and balance them out economically, that was the trick. To solve the problem, TVA would have to think big, and only an agency with power over an entire river could do what planners were about to propose. The main stem of the Tennessee would get 10 low dams for navigation, the tributaries would get 25 high dams to control flooding and generate power. It was a unified approach to corral water high in the mountains and carefully release it like a gentle wave. With 35 dams in all, the TVA would be the largest water control system on Earth. We had a sense of making history because this was the first time they had developed any place in the world a whole river system for competing purposes, navigation, flood control, and power. Not everyone thought it was a good idea, especially Tennessee Hill folk. Well, of course, we were surprised. I guess you could almost say we were shocked. To build dams meant that land would be taken. If land was taken and flooded, it meant that homes would be taken. Uh, the demands that it made on our culture and on our way of life, on our sense of family and of place, uh, this was not happy. T. 
TVA launched an exodus of epic proportions. 15,000 families were told they'd have to move. Their property would be flooded by the backwash of the giant dams. Homes were bought by the government and destroyed. The reservoirs would also claim the heart of the valley's agricultural community. 300,000 acres of farmland would be flooded forever. The project was so invasive it would even disturb the dead. Entire cemeteries were unearthed and moved to higher ground. Tennessee hill folk are known for their pride and independence, and there were fears that violence might erupt, but it did not. It's a little difficult for the Federals to come down to the, uh, this valley and, and tell people how to live their lives. That problem, well, it was a problem, uh, was solved because the Feds brought jobs, and that's what this valley needed above anything else. In fact, people poured out of the foothills to sign up for construction work. TVA was hiring like no one had hired before. Thousands of jobs for common laborers and skilled technicians. High paying work was something the valley had never known. With TVA taking all comers, things were looking up. My name was William Edwards, I live down Cold Creek Way. I'm working on that project they call the TVA. The government began it when I was but a child. But now they are in earnest and Tennessee's gone wild. As a public works project, TVA was an overnight success. The valley was put to work. Well, it was a very interesting place because there were hundreds of people just like me. Engineers came from around the country to be part of the biggest, most exciting construction project ever. We had jobs. We were happy. And we had jobs that we liked. All up and down the valley, they heard the glad alarm. The government means business, it's working like a charm. The government employs us, short hours and certain pay. Oh, things are up and coming, God bless the TVA. TVA Chairman Arthur Morgan was known for his boundless energy, and he set a construction schedule that was nothing short of frantic. In the early days of the TVA, there was enormous pressure to get the work under, underway. And there were thousands of people needing jobs, and they told him, hurry, hurry, hurry. And hurry he did. Dams were going up in record time, and at one point, 11 dams were under construction simultaneously. Work went so quickly that foundations were being built while engineers were still deciding how the tops of the dam should look. There was just so much to be done, but we didn't have to know the details. And so we could fill in the details on the drawings later on. To support this building frenzy, huge concrete mixers were designed to churn out six tons of cement every minute. An ingenious railroad and cable system delivered this concrete in drop-bottom buckets. Crews with pneumatic vibrators shook air bubbles out of the cement as it settled. TVA's first dam, Norris, required 166,000 buckets of cement. More than a million cubic yards delivered around the clock, bucket by bucket, every 90 seconds. When complete, Norris would be 265 feet high and 1,860 feet across. It could hold an entire year's rainfall in a lake measuring 83 square miles. Giant pipes called pinstocks would funnel this water toward two electric generators. Each section of pinstock weighed 40 tons and moving them into place was treacherous business. Thousands of men risked their lives every day at TVA dams. The work was gritty, backbreaking, and above all, dangerous. Something like this, where you've got these big buckets of concrete moving overhead on the cableway. If something went wrong with that cableway, 
Why, that bucket might fall, and no telling how many people would be killed below. There were accidents, and 112 men lost their lives. But that was considered a remarkably good record for a project so big. TVA workers received special training. This attention to safety paid off. In just one year, the Tennessee Valley Authority was off to a remarkable start. The hills were buzzing with the sounds of progress. Arthur Morgan succeeded beyond anyone's expectations. And with construction well underway, Morgan would take TVA into even more challenging territory, social engineering. The 1930s was a golden age for heavy construction throughout the United States. President Roosevelt viewed dams as a surefire way to provide jobs and rebuild America's battered economy. Dams were going up everywhere. In a steep desert gorge in southern Nevada, the towering Hoover Dam was rapidly rising. It would become America's tallest dam, measuring 726 feet. And in the Pacific Northwest, work was underway on the granddaddy of dams, the massive Grand Coulee Project on the Columbia River. A monument to the will of men determined to make nature work for the good of man. Hoover and Grand Coulee were built in isolated locations where men endured a rugged existence in temporary work camps. These tar paper towns featured raucous saloons and houses of prostitution. Back in the Tennessee Valley, Arthur Morgan wanted his projects to be something more. And so, TVA built the town of Norris, Tennessee, five miles downstream from Norris Dam. Norris would be a model community, a vision of what life could be with proper planning. Morgan was quite right that you don't have to let your construction villages turn into the hell holes that were so typical of large construction projects. You create proper homes for your, for your workers with families, proper dormitories for those who are unmarried. These small electrified cottages came also with a five-acre plot for, uh, for farming. Uh, there was nothing that he wouldn't try to improve the lives of his workers. Norris was a family town with churches and schools. Workers could rent a new four-room home for $14 a month, about one week's pay. Five dollars more got you a furnace, stove, refrigerator, and water heater. This was Arthur Morgan's dream, an idyllic community, a town that he himself called home. He even ate in the village cafeteria. Norris was a place where common laborers could picnic in the village green. David Lilienthal ridiculed Morgan's social programs and said Valley Life would improve if TVA focused on rapidly providing cheap electric power. But President Roosevelt believed government could be a benevolent force in people's lives, and he wanted Arthur Morgan to prove it in the Tennessee Valley. Roosevelt said to him the TVA should relate to every area of human concern. They weren't interested just in dams, just in flood control, just in power. They were interested in revitalizing the whole area in, uh, from top to bottom. Morgan applied his vision beyond the town of Norris. To combat the widespread problem of illiteracy, Morgan built a horse-drawn bookmobile to travel throughout the valley. Woodworking and machine shop classes taught people industrial skills. Children were vaccinated against disease. And to combat malaria, TVA spread enough insecticide to kill one billion malaria-breeding mosquitoes. To ensure that mosquitoes did not return, entire swamps were drained. Pumps sucked 100,000 gallons of murky swamp water every minute, sending it into the reservoirs, where it could do no harm. TVA had given the valley the tools it desperately needed. Residents were building more than an ambitious series of dams. They were building 
a better life. When you, you consider all of the workers needed for this massive construction project, common laborer making 45 cents an hour, eating all, uh, all he could eat in the TVA dining hall for 25 cents, uh, renting one of those electrified modern cottages for $14 a month, boy was that a change. TVA employees enjoyed the most progressive working conditions in the nation. They labored only five hours a day. That way more shifts were possible and everyone could get a job. There was work for women, good work at drafting tables and in power plants. There was also an early form of affirmative action. Blacks were employed in proportion to their population in the valley. They earned the same wages as whites, although they lived and sometimes worked in segregation. Morgan was attacked by critics for using the people of Tennessee as guinea pigs in a giant social experiment. But on the whole, folks in the valley were smiling. The Tennessee Valley was largely a rural region of tenant farmers who eked out a living on 70-acre plots of land. If TVA was going to make a major improvement in the standard of living, it would have to improve life on the farm. As well, the devastating floods and erosion were actually made worse by the way farmers traditionally plowed their land. TVA offered special assistance to 23,000 people who signed up to be test demonstration farmers. The best specialists in the country turned these farms into living laboratories. First, farmers learned to plow along the natural curves of the land. Contour plowing prevents rain from racing downhill and causing a flood. Next, farmers learned to use phosphate fertilizer which restored productivity to the tired soil. Then, a broad mixture of crops was introduced, including clover, tobacco, and wheat. Community threshers improved the efficiency of the harvest. The plan worked. The demonstration farmers dramatically increased their harvests. Even though half the valley's farmland had been flooded by reservoirs, the total farm output increased by nearly 100%. TVA had dramatically improved life in the valley, but the biggest improvement was yet to come. Electric power would change things in ways no one could anticipate. And it would create a power struggle that would tear TVA apart. By the late 1930s, America was back on its feet. The Great Depression was over. People were busy at work once again. The first of TVA's dams was rapidly coming online. And the Tennessee Valley, once a backward and forgotten place, was suddenly hopping. What made the difference more than anything was power. Peace and war, the dams work for the people. Power for the factories, power for new industry, power to run a million machines, turning out aircraft, tractors, textiles, engines, shoes, fertilizer, aluminum. Cheap and abundant power to light the cities and villages. Power for the farmers, power that can be converted to a hundred homely uses. Power working tirelessly, endlessly, raising standards, reducing drudgery. Power in the hands of the people. Power was the focus of TVA's youngest board member, David Lilienthal. To ensure continued prosperity for the Valley, he pushed TVA to become the nation's premier public power company. 
Lilienthal made TVA an electric dynamo. Dams produce 12 billion kilowatt hours each year, enough electricity to light more than 6 million homes. TVA sold its power at bargain basement rates. That was Lilienthal's great contribution. He's the one who understood that if you had low electric rates and if you had cheap electrical appliances, you could run power lines out into the countryside and demand would warrant, would justify the whole process. TVA strung enough wire to span the nation seven times. Towns that had never known electric light would soon leave the dark ages behind. The Tennessee Valley Authority is pushing lines into rural communities. Now the cross arm swings into place and the insulator is securely fastened. The line must be tied in firmly so that high winds and winter storms may not interrupt the delivery of cheap TVA kilowatts to farms and homes. Let us contrast for a moment yesterday with today and tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. TVA films chronicled how drastically life was changing. No longer would people scrub their laundry by hand. The wood-burning stove gave way to the electric range. Things we take for granted today were a godsend then. The Valley set national records for the sale of stoves and refrigerators. Classes taught people how to use their new appliances. Power brought the valley into the modern age. It even touched people's hearts. They could now listen to radio. Not for a moment have I doubted that we would climb out of the valley of gloom. To be able to hear Franklin Roosevelt, the man who had had this idea, to be able to hear him uh, make one of his great uh, addresses over the radio. This, I think, really was one of the great things. The radio was there and put us in touch with the world. TVA's system of dams worked like no single dam could. Stormwater, captured by high dams in the mountains, was carefully dispatched down the river valley. At every dam down the line, the river whirled through electric turbines, putting water to work again and again. With nature's bounty of near-limitless power came an explosion of industry. Grain mills opened. So did a modern cheese plant in dairy. One factory hatched chicks to launch a local poultry industry. Along the river, navigation locks made it easy for merchants to ship their goods to market. A barge would enter the lock through a giant doorway into a chamber 110 feet wide and 600 feet long. The doors would close and gravity-powered pumps would adjust the water level. Locks worked like a giant elevator, gracefully raising or lowering boats to get past a dam. In the Tennessee Valley, locks were essential to help boats navigate the 513-foot elevation change along the run of the river. This steep elevation drop made the river a treacherous string of shoals and rapids. But TVA dams smoothed out the ride, turning the river into a series of easy steps. Locks moved barges from step to step, changing elevation an average of 53 feet at every dam along the way. TVA dams were true engineering marvels. For Valley residents, they instilled a sense of pride, accomplishment, and optimism toward the future. Before TVA brought plentiful power to the Tennessee Valley, people who had electricity were at the mercy of private power monopolies. These companies offered no rural service, and in large towns, the price was more than most anyone could afford. The situation was similar in much of the nation. President Roosevelt claimed high-priced power was strangling the economy. I believe that the individual should have full liberty of action to make the most of himself. 
But I do not believe that in the name of that sacred word, a few powerful interests should be permitted to make industrial cannon fodder of the lives of half the population of the United States. In the Tennessee Valley, industrialist Wendell Wilkie was a virtual power baron until TVA came along. TVA sold power at half the price Wilkie was charging, which prompted Wilkie to take TVA to court. It would become a national test case on the legality of public power production. And if it is constitutional for the federal government to do that, then there is no way of stopping the government's invasion of every sphere of private enterprise, whether great or small. Inside the TVA, Arthur Morgan and David Lilienthal locked horns in a bitter feud over how to respond. The chief problem was over two areas extremely important to Arthur Morgan. One was that you never compete, you always cooperate. Lilienthal, with his experience in dealing with the private power uh, companies, knew that this was a bitter street fight and cooperation was going to get you nothing but a knife in the neck. Morgan felt private companies should keep their share of the market. TVA should serve new customers only. To Morgan, that seemed efficient and fair. But Lilienthal called this a sellout. The charge stung Morgan deeply. My father never sold out to anybody, let alone the power company. He was not, he was never for sale. The internal fight turned public as Wendell Wilkie's case against public power pressed through the courts. It seemed the pressure was too much for Arthur Morgan to bear. In two magazine articles, Morgan accused David Lilienthal of dishonest behavior at the TVA. Morgan said Congress should investigate. The charge sparked a national scandal. President Roosevelt ordered Morgan to prove his allegations at an event unparalleled in American history, a presidential court of inquisition. The President of the United States is the judge and the prosecutor and the jury in this case. And the press is waiting outside getting transcripts of every page. Starts on March 11, 1938. Morgan says, I'll have nothing to do with this. I've been calling for a congressional investigation. And then he says, I'm not prepared. You didn't tell me to bring any stuff. Roosevelt gives him a week. Morgan comes back and says, this is improper. We need a congressional investigation. <laughs> Roosevelt says, I'll give you until Monday, and that's it. Morgan comes in on Monday and says, Mr. President, I can have nothing more to do with these affairs, gets on a train, leaves D.C., and goes back to Yellow Springs, Ohio. The next day, March 22nd, 1938, Roosevelt fires Arthur Morgan, thus ending in rather dramatic fashion what's clearly Roosevelt's toughest personnel problem. The visionary who had launched the greatest dam building project in history fell from grace amid the rough and tumble of politics. TVA was far from finished. Only eight of the dams were complete. And Morgan's dream of social and economic planning was badly bruised. The TVA had something started here which was unique in the world. And this is something that could have been uh, become a, a model it could have been uh, re reproduced all over the place, but it never was. There's only one TVA, and that's a great tragedy. It only it stopped here. Arthur Morgan got his congressional hearing, but nothing came of it. He returned to his post in Ohio. David Lilienthal became TVA chairman. In court, Wendell Wilkie lost his battle with the TVA and quickly sold his power empire to the government for $79 million. It made TVA the nation's largest power company. Still, the future looked grim. The TVA had survived. It, however, had lost much of its momentum. Congressional support after all of those embarrassing fights was no longer what it was. And the support it enjoyed in the Valley uh, had lessened as well because of the terrible bitterness and this awful bloodletting at the top of its leadership. So far, TVA had accomplished an engineering miracle. The question was, could it survive long enough to finish the job? December 7, 1941, Pearl Harbor is attacked and America goes to war. America's entry into World War II 
brought new life to the Tennessee Valley Authority. Dam construction had languished after the political dogfights between TVA's leaders. But now, TVA was back on track with an added sense of urgency. America prepares. Mighty rivers harnessed by towering dams to the service of peacetime industry turn their power to the nation's defense. Here in the Tennessee Valley is a tremendous power plant, a source of natural energy that is forging modern armor for Uncle Sam. Nearly one million kilowatts flowing in an irresistible stream of power through a valley protected by mountains from the most daring foe. Strength of over a million horses in a region that contains one-third of the raw materials essential to defense. To provide even more power, TVA built dams quicker than they had ever been built before. Douglas Dam, 200 feet high and 1,700 feet across, went up in just 12 months. Government posters stressed how important dam construction was. Throughout the valley, peacetime production was converted to manufacturing the materiel of war. Fertilizer factories retooled to make ammonium nitrate, essential for bombs, grenades, and bullets. The valley turned out 300 tons of ammonium nitrate every day. Textile mills made tents and uniforms to supply the millions of soldiers headed overseas. Four and a half million pairs of boots were produced here during the war. The valley's most important product was aluminum. It takes tremendous amounts of energy to refine aluminum. A single roll requires enough power to run a typical house for 27 years. During World War II, aluminum meant air power. Training planes were built right in the valley. And huge shipments of aluminum were sent to factories elsewhere to build the super fortress the B-29. A single B-29 bomber required 10 tons of aluminum. Without the rapid production of these mighty machines, America might not have ruled the skies of the Pacific. TVA made another key contribution to America's war machine, one that most people didn't know at the time. TVA provided power for a secret city of 50,000 people a city with a mission so important that no one was allowed to talk about it. Oak Ridge would refine uranium to build the most destructive device ever invented, the atom bomb. TVA became a crucial part of the war effort and in doing so, ensured its own survival. The Tennessee Valley Authority is the only New Deal construction agency to become a permanent part of the U.S. government. TVA still exists to manage and maintain its ingenious network of multi-purpose dams. These dams have worked flawlessly. Flooding is a thing of the past. More than two billion dollars in property damage has been avoided. The Tennessee River is now a vital cargo artery. Barges move efficiently along the 652 mile river, ultimately connecting with the Mississippi and the world of international trade. The Tennessee Valley continues to be an industrial powerhouse. Cheap hydroelectricity has turned a valley of struggling farmers into one of America's greatest manufacturing hubs. TVA has continued to face controversy, particularly from environmentalists. The agency built coal-fired power plants after World War II, which supported the destructive practice of strip mining. TVA also expanded into the contentious world of nuclear power, and one of its dams has pushed a tiny fish, the snail darter, into extinction. Still, TVA's system of dams remains an unequaled feat of civil engineering. Their supply of power has been steady and unwavering for decades. 
TVA's first generator, Unit 1, at Norris Dam, worked like a Swiss watch until its first overhaul 58 years after going online. The giant pinstocks, where 31,000 gallons of water thunder every second to meet the electric turbines, have withstood the test of time. The men and women of TVA built their dams to last. Their legacy will live on forever. Well, I've often wondered what would have happened if TVA hadn't come in. We wouldn't have gotten as many benefits, I'm sure, as we're getting now. What they did was, was incredible, and a sense of fulfillment, and a sense of identity, and a sense of simply doing good. Nowadays, it's easy to think of the TVA as simply the federal government's largest public power company. But on the other hand, I think that legacy of the 1930s, that decentralization, that autonomy from Washington, D.C., that identification with a particular region, that sense of multiple missions continues to this very day. The Valley of the Tennessee was once a place of fear and terror, but now its placid lakes are a place of beauty and serenity. TVA accomplished more than anyone thought possible it not only conquered the ferocious spirit of an untamed river, it brought hope to a place that knew only despair. <laughs>